You want to be a Marine first off because you want to be the best. In the Marine Corps, you're there for one reason, and training for one reason, and that's fight. do more with less because we had less. They were highly motivated and they worked towards a common goal, the goal of protecting the nation. You're not only serving the American people, but you're serving your team. Your team is your lifeline. It's the most important thing to you downrange. Americans sleep peacefully in their beds because rough men stand ready in the night to visit violence on those that would do them harm. Somebody's got to do it. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Manukian, Ms. Manukian, uh, Michael, Marty, uh, to your great community. Um, while I'm sad to not be there with you in person today, I got to tell you, it's an absolute honor to be able to talk to you and share a little bit of history about uh, what the Marine Raiders are about and uh, mo of most importance what Matthew Manukian meant to the Raider community, to the Marine Corps as a whole, uh, and, to, and to the world as a whole. Uh, before I get to the opportunity to do that, uh, just a quick uh, introduction of myself. Uh, my name is uh, Jody Lynch. I'm currently the commanding officer of the Marine Raider Regiment. I've had the, the honor and the privilege of serving in the Marine Corps for close to 25 years now. The last 12 of that being uh, within the Marine Special Operations Command. Uh, part of that time was spent with Matthew, which I'll have the, the honor to talk about here shortly. But before doing so, I thought I'd share just a, a brief history of how the Marine Raiders came about. Marine Raiders date back to uh, World War II, the beginning of World War II, uh, and primarily in the, in the um, in the island hopping campaigns of the Pacific, uh, the Marine Corps uh, decided to, to create um, some special high-end units uh, that were great at uh, going abroad and disrupting the Japanese in these highly contested uh, island areas. Uh, very good at sabotage, very good at cutting communication, and very good at really causing a lot of chaos and disruption so that the larger Marine Corps could, could launch its operations as needed and as we all know, uh, victoriously um, set the mark within the Pacific. Unfortunately, at the, uh, as the island hopping campaigns became a success and it rolled on, uh, the need for the Marine Raiders, uh, also uh, proudly known as the first special operations organization uh, in, within the United States of America, uh, were disbanded. And uh, they were disbanded back into the Marine Corps, and uh, the Marine Corps carried on, and carried on for decades. Uh, Fast forward to 2006 time frame when, uh, when we were absolutely uh, at max capacity in terms of the Iraq and the Afghan war. Uh, then uh, the, Honorable, uh, the Honorable Secretary of Defense, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, um, mandated that the Marine Corps would establish a Marine Special Operations Command that would fall under the larger Special Operations Command. Of course, the Marine Corps had some initial pushback on that. Uh, not, not because they didn't believe they belonged, but because they were already there. 
And uh, I think that that is a fair and honest and assessment and argument of what we are as a Marine Corps as a whole. We are already a small elite force designed to do a specific mission for our country. And, uh, and to dive into something that was smaller, more, uh, uh, more specific, or carry the title of special, uh, just rightfully um, rubs some the wrong way. Uh, because the Marine Corps and our ethos and our beliefs, and uh, whether it's a little bit, um, you know, whether it's a little bit uh, cocky or not, uh, we do believe we are something special, and we do bring something for this great nation, and uh, and, and we don't need the title to do it. Uh, but. Like all good Marines do, uh, when mandated to stand up a Marine Special Operations Command, we followed orders and that's exactly what we did. And on February 24th of 2006, uh, Marine Special Operations Command was born. Uh, within Marine Special Operations Command, as it stands to date, uh, over the last few years, it has gone through some iterations, but where it stands today is roughly 3,000 personnel. That's from the Commanding General that oversees the entire Special Operations Command down to every single civilian, sailor, and Marine that operates within, within the uh, construct of MARSOC, 3,000. Under MARSOC, it's broken down into three main, what we call major subordinate commands. Uh, one is the Marine Raider Training Center, which is responsible for producing Marine Raiders and Special Operations capable Marines. We have the Marine, Special Opera the Marine Raider Special Operations Group, which is responsible for a lot of our technology and specialists, such as intelligence and communications and logistic logisticians. And then we have the Marine Raider Regiment. And the Marine Raider Regiment is the portion of the organization that deploys the trained and equipped force to go forward and do the things that are necessary for our country. Under the Marine Raider Regiment, it's 1,500 personnel. And just to put things in scope, when you think of MARSOC as a whole of 3,000, that's in comparison to the Naval Special Warfare, where all the SEAL units belong and, 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 and exist, is, is 10,000, roughly 10,000. And within USASOC, where you hear about uh, the Green Berets and Rangers, uh, those numbers are, are closer to 30,000. And MARSOC is three. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very small percentage of SOCOM. It's a very, very small percentage of the Marine Corps as a whole, but it's, it packs a lot of punch. And uh, rightfully so, uh, on any given day across the globe, we have forces forward deployed uh, focused on a counterterrorism mission. Uh, currently, we have forces in Southeast Asia uh, representing the Pacific area. We have them in East Africa, as well as across the Middle East, uh, primarily in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we continue to fight the counterterrorism fight as, as, as we have unfortunately had to get to know it over the last couple of decades. We're good. As I discussed, uh, being globally deployed in a, in a very small portion of the formation, continuing this fight for over two decades now, what, what drives a Marine who's already part of arguably a very elite force within the Department of Defense is just being a Marine? And, and specifically, a Marine, because as you come to MARSOC, we're not going to recruit you below the rank of sergeant or as an officer below the rank of captain. So you've already proven yourself in numerous ways. You've proven yourself, you've led Marines, you've led Marines overseas, and more than likely you've led Marines in combat. You've been through the toughest schools. As, a, as, as an infantry officer, going through infantry officer course is, is arguably one of the toughest schools that's out there across DOD. You've proven yourself time and time again, but then there's this organization out there known as MARSOC, that if you choose to volunteer and go, you will, then, you will then subject yourself again to a three-week assessment selection in which you will be graded physically, mentally, your behavioral pattern, and your overall intellect. If you're fortunate enough to make it through assessment selection, you'll go through another seven months of, indivi of the individual training course, which will prepare you to be a basic critical skills operator or special operations officer. So, when you think about that and you think about what we draw from, it's, it's, it's kind of a two-edged sword. First and foremost, it's very hard to recruit because, like I stated, we're recruiting from within the Marine Corps, which is already 
an elite organization that does amazing things globally. But the positive to it is this, is those that come are truly the best and the brightest. And in a lot of ways, what we've come to find out is really what we're recruiting into this organization. And the one thing that rings true in all our Marines and sailors that, that serve this organization is, is we're truly looking for the most intellectual and the smartest Marine that's too stupid to quit anything. And that is what we're after. Uh, and I think our assessment selection does that. ITC prepares them, and then they come to the Raider Regiment, and they're ready to, they're ready to fall into formation, do additional training, and then deploy globally in some of the most austere, challenging environments we could, we could put uh, our forces in, all for the good of this country. But besides that, there are some common themes that I've picked up on, that I see, uh, that exist across, and, and at this point I'm going to talk primarily about Special Operations Officers, because that's what Matthew was. And uh, I want to highlight as well before I talk about this that on average, we average about 130 special operations officers on active duty at any given time, which is, which is one of the, which is just an, in, in terms of comparison to the other services, even within special operations, in terms of comparisons to the Marine Corps, is an absolute um, minimal number. And so just to, to be a special operations officer is something um, that's very, it's, uh, you have to be goal driven and you have to have a purpose, all right? And so I go back to my point is what is, what is the purpose? What drives somebody to want to, to really lay themselves out there and to be exposed? Uh, as I stated, the, the training is tough. Uh, you're gonna be stressed in numerous ways and, and your weaknesses are gonna be exposed. And when you think about that, who really wants to do that? And I think there's some common traits amongst the Sioux that I see. Uh, uh, those that are younger, uh, obviously those that are younger than me, those that were Captain Manukian's uh, in Captain Manukian's group, and those that are here today as, as team commanders. But they have common traits. And I think the number one common trait is amongst all of them is, is they believe in something bigger. Um, they believe in something bigger than themselves. They believe in teamwork. They believe in greater responsibility. They believe in greater accountability. They believe in the ability to make a difference, whether that be a difference of an individual to their left or to their right, whether that be a difference to the organization in which they serve, or whether that be a difference within a foreign country that they've never set foot in before and may never set foot in again. They believe in something bigger. Um, it's inspiring, it inspires those around them, and it creates that gung-ho attitude and that gung-ho mentality of we can do, we will do, and we will be successful. Um, I think that that, above all, um, regardless of the hard skills in which we train and test, um, those are the common personalities that I, that I think make the best Sioux. And as, uh, as I'll begin to talk and transition to talk about uh, Matthew, um, I think that that rings true for anybody that knows him, knows that as exactly the type of person he was, uh, the person that uh, many that know him strive to be today to include myself, and those that never knew him but continue to serve in his footsteps, understand that, and they too believe. A lot of commonalities amongst the leaders in this organization, and uh, that one common trend of just believing in something greater. Uh, there's one person, as I've had the opportunity and the privilege to lead so many great men and women in this organization, um, there's one that's always stuck out to me. Uh, and that is uh, Captain Matthew Manukian. And uh, at this point, I just want to share a little bit of the story about why that is. And uh, it really dates back to a time in uh, Matthew's first deployment as a team commander. And uh, one of my first deployments, I was an operations officer uh, tied to Special Operations Task Force West. And Matthew was out as a team commander, just doing extraordinary work. Um, I didn't get a chance to know him personally in that position, but I knew of him well. I knew of his reputation. I knew of his leadership. And the confidence he, bestilled, he instilled within his men, uh, and, 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 and more than that, the partner force and everything that he was doing in country. And, uh, and it just became an absolute, um, for me, an honor to watch all of these young team commanders do what they were doing uh, within, the, within the fight. At that time, um, at that time was a unique time within Afghanistan. And uh, we had done, as I said, it, you know, we're a combat, we are, we're, um, we're a counterterrorism organization and very lethal organization that's designed to do um, 
designed designed to do that, just that is to understand the networks of our enemies and uh, reduce those networks uh, and make them less effective. Uh, but that's all for a purpose, and that is a purpose normally to empower, uh, to give the will to uh, a partner force and a nation in which we are working with to help them instill uh, a way of life that is better for their people and uh, better for the longevity and the safety of, of the world at large. Um, but in doing so in Afghanistan, because of the complexity of the situation, um, tactics, we changed tactics a bit. And uh, we took a play from, uh, we took a page out of the playbook going back to the Vietnam time of, if, if you're a history buff, of the combined action platoons and how they um, pacified many, many provinces within, uh, within South Vietnam um, and, and uh, ridded them of uh, the Viet Cong and started to establish a lot of uh, stability. Unfortunately, it was, it was uh, too late in the fight from a political perspective to make a long-term impact. But that program itself was very successful. And some smart leaders associated within the Special Operations Command uh, took a play from that book and established it uh, within Afghanistan and asked special operations to change overnight in a lot of ways, right? So think about an organization that's trained, manned, and equipped to conduct raids pretty much on a nightly basis to go after some of the, some of the worst personalities in the country in order to kind of free up that, that, uh, that movement and uh, free up the ability of that, that host nation, in this case the Afghans, to start to, to take power and start to, um, start to create security uh, for their people. And, uh, and overnight, we took a, a, a large position at force and said, we're gonna change. We're gonna change the mission. And we're gonna reestablish you as what we call village stability platforms uh, and, and run village stability operations. And at this time, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some hand-selected teams and we're gonna put you in some of the worst areas in Afghanistan and ask you to start to basically organize the local populace into what the Afghans refer to as shuras, uh, local, think of it as local uh, district uh, and, and town councils, uh, localize um, um, security forces that that commission or that shura has approved of, train them, and then ideally within that construct, start to connect that construct and that leadership at the lower level into the district. And we would try to do a bottom-up approach and connect um, very local influential leaders that had basically been disempowered by the Taliban and other organizations to stand back up and stand back up for their tribes, for their people, connect them into greater government of Afghanistan through district and provincial centers. Fast forward to 2012 and uh, at that point we continued to maintain a lot of focus in Helmand province which is by far the most volatile province in all of Afghanistan, one of the most complex from a tri tribal perspective complex in that it is the, uh, the no number one uh, producer of, of poppy, which leads to opioids and leads to that entire black market trade, uh, finances the Taliban. So there, there is a lot at stake um, and it's a, a very complex and uh, harsh environment. In fact, for the time leading up to that, as I mentioned previous deployments even by, uh, by Matthew and myself, um, a lot of just lethal and kinetic operations throughout Helmand province for years. But in 2012, when Matthew went back, Matthew was one of those teams that was chosen. Uh, Matthew's team was one that was chosen to go into what I would call uh, one of the darkest areas in Helmand province at that time, uh, which was an uh, area known as Sangin. It was north of Sangin. Sangin was a district center and uh, north of Sangin in a little, little area called Puse. And, uh, and, and think, uh, for two years leading up to that mark, that when you strong pointed a team in a location to go outside of the wire, all right, to go outside of that perimeter that you could secure with your personal weapons, uh, would require you literally to get on your hands and knees and utilize your fingers to feel through the ground for IEDs, trip wires, and anything else because that's how fast you were belted in and protected in to, 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 uh, to minimize your impact in the area. And that's where they would be working from. They would go into a platform, right? And then within the first probably 72 to 96 hours, the enemy would work against them and belt them in in a lot of, a lot of, a lot of unique ways at night um, in manners that worked against our rules of engagement, so that limited what we could do 
but belt and, 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 and basically tie that team in where it could not have the freedom of maneuver to get out and, and really start to understand the leaders in the area and really start to, um, to, uh, to pull them together and, and, and build a synergy within, within, those, with, within, that, local, within that, that local community. And so in, uh, in spring of 2012, when, when Matthew took his team in, uh, they did that and that's where they went to Puse. And within, uh, I had a unique opportunity um, a couple months later, about the July timeframe, uh, to go into Puse and spend an entire day with Matthew, his team chief, Gunnery Sergeant Ryan Jeske, and his team uh, about the, uh, the advances they had made. And it was absolutely extraordinary is the only word I can come up with. I, I, in all of my time in combat deployments from the time I was a captain, I had never seen somebody have an effect like this in a space, in an area that was so contested, so volatile, um, death on a daily basis. Um, we left the compound and walked around for kilometers with nothing more on than I'm wearing right here in front of you today. No helmets, no protective equipment, uh, pistols only. And uh, as we walked and talked, and talked about the gains and how Matt and his team did this, I cannot even, I'll never, re, never forget and I'll never know how many kids walked up and all referred to Captain Matt, Captain Matt, and uh, and how how he developed that, and uh, and and this goes back to my bigger point, and and Puse, um, through the years as I deployed back again in 2014 and all of 2014, still had the strongest local police force, local Shura that had a voice and was connected to the larger district center of Sangin and continued to do everything that Matthew's team had taught it to do two and a half years ahead of that time. Um, it was remarkable and it, it made change. And, and that, that's the point here. Um, the point here is as we walked and we talked that and I got to know Matt more on a personal level in that discussion in that day, it was about the beliefs. It was about that continuous smile he had on his face at all times. This belief in something bigger. This belief that it will work. We will make it work. We won't just make it work because we'll force it. We'll make it work because we're, we're just so damn positive. And we believe in this so much that those around us start to believe in it too. And it is contagious. And I think any of us that have worked in any environment that way, whether it be at a local school or, or a county or a state or in government or in a business, you know that feeling. You know that leader that creates that optimism, that has that vision. And, and he can execute that vision in his daily actions. And that was Matthew. And that was Matthew inside and out. And the trust and confidence he had instilled within that populace, and within that population center, was, it, was nothing short of just extraordinary. It was, it was the blueprint of how to do it. And I've said this, I've said this a hundred times in public. I've lost count of how many VSO sites we ran at the highest level. I, I want to say it was, I, I may be selling this way short, but I know it was well over 50 village stability platforms throughout Afghanistan, and, and it may have been more. Um, my memory escapes me. But, but I will tell you this, if they all had the capability to do what Team 8133 did, led by Matthew Manukian, and that belief, and that strength, I truly believe in all my heart, Afghanistan would be a different, would be in a different situation today than it is now. And that's not a hit on anybody else uh, because there are extraordinary teams out there doing amazing things. That's to highlight the power of Matthew. And that's the only reason I say that. Because you can't produce that. You can't just, you, you, you can't train that. You can't produce that through a, a pipeline. You can't, you can't teach it. It's it's, it's just, it's in you. Um, we all know that, you know, Matthew had a lot of conversations with his family. He, um, he was more than likely going to um, leave the Marine Corps after that deployment. But it was to go do more great, extraordinary things and a bigger avenue and probably in a way that it could affect the military and affect his fellow Marines and his fellow Marine Raiders in numerous ways from different, from different avenues. And regardless of what he chose to do, he would have made everybody around him better because that was just Matthew. And it was just absolutely, um, it was it was mine, it, it, it just like, to this day, I still can't calculate how he did what he did. 
Um, I, all I can tell you is it's, it's, um, it has stood the test of time. Um, as we still continue on in Afghanistan today, there are relationships that are built in that area that still aid U.S. forces and their efforts to continue to combat the Taliban and to set the Afghan government up for long-term success. Unfortunately, in August, we know uh, in a sad, sad way, um, you know, through, uh, through operations, um, we lost Matthew. And, um, and, and I'll never forget that call, I'll never forget where I was, and I'll never forget the impact. Um, and, and the day that we lost Matthew, Sky Moat, and Ryan Jeske, all doing what they love to do and all doing what they believe to do. Did they take risks? They absolutely took risks. We all take risks. They took risks to win. They took risks because of what they believed in. And, and, and at no fault of their own, because like I stated, they did everything, everything better than any team I'd ever seen do in these environments. We unfortunately paid the ultimate sacrifice. And unfortunately, as I've become a parent, I have kids of my own, you know, we, we say that the Marine or the sailor themselves or the airman or the army soldier, the Navy so, uh, sailor, SEAL pays the ultimate sacrifice. And, and, and when we lose them in combat, they do. But I think the true, the true person that, plays the, that pays the ultimate sacrifice when we lose a service member fighting for our country or at any time, at any place, in any tragedy, is the parents. Because until you have kids, you'll never understand it. And, uh, and I know I've said it before, there's not a thing in the world that I could think is so important that would be worth the life of one of my two daughters. Nothing. But what I can tell you all is what we do today and what Matthew did is something that we believe in and we believe in so finely. And Matthew's actions carry on in all of us today. We'll never quit. We'll never stop. We'll never stop believing. We'll never stop believing in the ability to create hope, to create a chance for something to be better. And sometimes we have to do that through violent mechanisms and other times we can do that by creating partnerships and relationships. We'll do it in any manner possible. But we do do it for one reason and one reason only. It's because we do believe in our country. We believe in everything that it stands for. We truly believe that the United States of America in a lot of ways is that beacon of hope for so many countries that don't have a chance. That so many people within countries that are never afforded an opportunity or chance that we have. And sometimes it's the simplest thing in the world to just make the personal sacrifice, to serve, to go forward, to believe in who we are, believe in what we are as Americans, take that forward, display it on a daily basis, display it in belief of who we are and what we bring, and you would be blown away by the hope that that brings. And when you see that catch, just like the the Afghan people in Puse, that's what they caught. They caught Matthew's belief. They caught his belief in the greater good. They brought. They caught his belief and hope, and hope that things would be better. I watched Matthew do it twice. I watched him do it on our first deployment from afar, um, in, a, in a place called Five Robinson, and then I saw him return and do it in Puse in person. And and Mr. and Mrs. Manukian, Michael, Marty, and the entire community. The only thing I can promise you is you have a command of Marines and sailors and civilians that are so dedicated to the same things that Matthew is dedicated for. And we'll spend the rest of our lives, we'll never quit, we'll never stop, and we'll continue to try to push exactly what Matthew believed, which is to make people better, make things better than you found it. Have some hope. It's okay to believe in hope. It's okay to dream big. Just have a plan of action to get there. Matthew did and he always got there. And Matthew, on behalf of you, to your family, this entire organization will absolutely always have a plan, always execute, and we absolutely will make those around us better and do everything in our power to protect this country and to make our partner forces and our partner countries as strong as we can possibly make them. I can't thank you enough for your service, Mr. and Mrs. Mnookin, I can't ever put into words how sorry I am for your loss. 
but I will tell you we will carry on in Matthew's name for the rest of our lives and for the rest of our times in service. And again, it's just been an absolute honor and a pleasure to be able to speak to you today. And I really, really look forward to the day I can be there in person. And I promise you, if you'll have me, uh, I, will, I, will, I will be there as, uh, as soon as I humanly possible can make that happen. Uh, God bless, Semper Fidelis, and I wish you all an absolutely wonderful day to celebrate one of the most amazing men that have ever walked this planet, Captain Matthew Minukian. Semper Fi.